All right, so in the last video, we discovered why we should not fear God if we are an atomist. Uh, but now we need to see why we shouldn't fear death if we're an atomist. It's remember the overall project. We're trying to eliminate mental trouble. We're helping people find tranquility by eliminating sources of fear. Uh, and if you're an atomist, Epicurus argues you shouldn't fear God because then God's just this physical thing that can't affect your life. But he also claims that it is irrational to fear death itself. Uh, this explanation is a little more complicated, though, because it requires us to look into what Epicurus believes the best life is like. Uh, so first, let's start out by inspecting that. All right, so... Uh, first, Epicurus gives us a discussion of value, right? What What is good? What are the things we should desire? Uh, and Epicurus says the standard of goodness is the obtaining of pleasure and the absence of pain. It's a very common idea that runs through a lot of philosophy, right? Pleasure has this sort of fundamental value uh, that we need to account for. Um, Plato always, not Plato always said, but Plato said at times that uh, pleasure was just something that the appetitive part of the soul was after. And so these physical base pleasures aren't really things to go after. Uh, Aristotle had a, a nicer view of pleasure, but still thought our life shouldn't be centered around pleasure because uh, pleasure and happiness weren't the same thing. Epicurus is going to say, no, nope, pleasure really is the fundamental value. Right. So why should we believe him? Right? We've heard a lot of philosophers say so far that pleasure is not the fundamental value. It's just one of many values we should care about. Uh, so he says we should believe this because we recognize pleasure as the first good innate in us. And from pleasure, we begin every act of choice and avoidance. And to pleasure, we return again. In other, fa in other words, if you look at every human, <laughs> if you look at your own experience, this is just a brute fact about our psychology, All right? So from the very first moment you come into the world, uh, you're not conscious of this, but your body is desiring pleasure and trying to avoid pain. And as you grow up, you keep going through this practice. You get more rational about the things you desire and more rational about the things that bring you pleasure. But still, everything you're doing is, uh, in some sense, chasing down pleasure or trying to avoid pain. And so Epicurus's argument here is essentially, if this is so basic to human psychology, then our theory of the good life should be able to account for that, right? So pleasure is going to be the standard of goodness that he's working with. However, um, all pleasures are not equal, right? So he does think that there are some pleasures that are more worthwhile than others, and we should structure our life uh, by sort of chasing down the ones that matter more. So how is he going to divide up all the pleasures in the world? Well, the first distinction is between the bodily and mental pleasures. And we have a pretty good idea of what this is like already, right? The bodily pleasures are just fulfilling your desires for food, drink, sleep, sex, drugs, back rubs, etc. Um, if you need an analog, right, this is what the appetitive part of the soul is really after in Plato and Aristotle, right? It's about these base pleasures that the body wants. There are also the mental pleasures. Uh, we have desires for uh, mental things like power, knowledge, achievement, contemplation, problem solving, etc., Right, so these are all the pleasures that seem to come uh, as a result of our rationality or reasoning skills. So if you want the analog again, this is like Plato and Aristotle talking about the reasoning part of your soul. Right, so Epicurus is not talking about souls at all because he doesn't believe there is a soul. He just believes that there are atoms, right? Atoms and void, so there is no soul. But still, we have these two types of pleasures within the human uh, body, right? We have bodily pleasure. And we get pleasure also from mental things. Okay. The second distinction is the distinction between desires that are fully satisfiable and desires that can never be fully satisfied. So what's an example of a fully satisfiable pleasure? Well, a particular achievement, solving a problem, getting a bit of knowledge, uh, bodily pleasures that don't necessarily reoccur by their nature. 
what do I mean here? Well, okay, let's take particular achievement for an example. I want to uh, graduate college. You guys want to graduate college. Uh, we probably will want to achieve a particular career, so on and so forth, right? There are particular things we hope to achieve in our life. And once you achieve that thing, it's fully satisfied. You don't have to keep working at it, right? Once they put the degree in your hand, you have fully satisfied that particular achievement and you get the pleasure from that achievement. The same with problem solving, right? If you want to solve this problem, well, the second you solve it, you don't have to keep trying to solve it. It's done. You fully satisfied that source of pleasure. Now, what do, why do I say particular achievement or bodily pleasures that don't necessarily occur, right? Because you could just want achievement for achievement's sake, right? You just could want general achievement and that brings you pleasure. You just really like achieving things, right? But if that's the case, that's never going to be fully satisfiable because there are always more things to achieve, right? So a fully satisfiable pleasure has to be sort of particularized like this. Uh, in the same way, bodily pleasures that don't necessarily reoccur. So maybe you want to taste lobster once in your life. That's fully satisfiable. You can go do that tomorrow. But if you want to um, eat a new fine food every day until you die, right? That wouldn't be fully satisfiable um, because there's always going to be more for you to try. Okay. So there are other clear examples of pleasures that cannot be fully satisfied. Hunger and thirst are clear examples because hunger and thirst are always reoccurring. Right? You can get rid of your hunger for now, but it's going to be back tonight or it's going to be back tomorrow morning. Same with your thirst. Right? That's reoccurring, so it can never be fully satisfied. Power works in the same way, according to Epicurus. Right? If you desire power... Well, there's always more power for you to have. So power can never be fully satisfied. Okay, so we know the two distinctions. How do they shake out? What's the best one to go after? So Epicurus thought the best types of pleasure were those that were mental and fully satisfiable. So if you compare eating a fancy dinner to solving a difficult problem, which pleasure would you prefer? Now you can ask yourself all these questions. Right? Between those two choices, which would you prefer? Which pleasure lasts you longer? Which is more intense? Which will need to be satisfied again? If we think about just these two examples, right? you eat your fancy dinner. Okay, it's complete. It's fully satisfied, but it's a bodily pleasure. And so your body feels good. Uh, your taste buds were satisfied. You get all the pleasure from eating that meal. Uh, but it's gone like 30 minutes later, right? You're no, you're no longer tasting that. Maybe you have a little bit of satisfaction left over, but it's gone. It's done. When you solve a difficult problem, right, this is fully satisfiable, but it's also mental. And so why is the mental more valuable? Well, think about what that, uh, the lasting effect of solving a problem, right? Whenever, I don't know if you've ever taken a math class or a philosophy class where you have to do some uh, deductions or something like that. But if you have a brain teaser and you're stuck on it and you spend all of this time trying to solve the problem and then it finally clicks and you solve it, right? That's a very satisfying feeling that lasts. It sticks with you. So even though eating a fancy dinner is something that's fully satisfiable, it's less valuable because it's that bodily pleasure and bodily pleasures are seemingly fleeting where the mental pleasures are fully satisfiable and last longer. Okay. Um, another way of... Um, yeah, good. So not all pleasures are created equal. We should chase down those mental and fully satisfiable pleasures. Now to go back to power for a second, think about why this is bad for you, right? So power is a mental pleasure, but it cannot be fully satisfied. And so that's bad for you. The fully satisfiable will always be better. Think about why that is. Well, it's because with power, there's always more to have. So say you Let's just quantify power for a second. Say you reach 37 uh, power. Well, why not want more, right? Why not go for 38? And once you hit 38, why not 39? 
okay, I'm 40 power, right? And why not be 50 at that point, right? You're always going to want more power if you have a desire for these non-fully satisfiable things. And so that's why the fully satisfiable are always more worthwhile for you to chase after if you want to live a life that is pleasant, right? If you always want power, that desire is always going to cause you a little bit of pain because you can never fully satisfy it. So keep that in mind. It's all about living the best life. It's all about living a pleasant life of mental tranquility. And you can't have that if you chase things that you can never truly have enough of. So you need to find things that can be satisfied. And then we already discussed why the mental is better than the bodily. Okay. So how do you live the best life? Well, you're chasing down the mental and fully satisfiable pleasures. And you try and gain as much pleasure as possible while eliminating those things that cause you pain. So um, here's an example of the type of life you could try and live, right? You should try and gain knowledge, spend time contemplating the world. These are things that can be satisfied. You can gain knowledge about that. Um, we shouldn't strive for mental pleasures such as power money or glory because they always come with a need for more so already it's starting to sound a little bit like aristotle there right aristotle was saying the best life is the one of theoretical wisdom the life of contemplation epicurus is saying something similar but epicurus isn't saying we need to live the life of theoretical wisdom so we can become more like the first mover Right. Epicurus is saying we need to get this type of theoretical wisdom because it's just pleasant. It's a mental and fully satisfiable pleasure that we can go achieve. Um, and so the life of enjoyment or the life of uh, political life of life of honor that Aristotle were talking about, they're both bad, according to Epicurus, because they aren't fully satisfiable mental pleasures. And those are more uh, pleasant pleasures. Okay, but we need we have a very important question left over, right? Okay, sure. So we shouldn't chase uh, the bodily pleasures. We shouldn't chase power, money, and glory, and food, and sex, so on and so forth. Uh, but don't we need to satisfy some of the body, right? Don't we need to give the body some pleasure in order for us to even chase down the mental ones in the first place, right? So the mental ones, yeah, I agree. They're the most important, but we still have bodily needs, Right, so we can't just completely ignore the pleasure of the body. So here, Epicurus says we should seek to minimize our bodily desires to make them easily satisfiable. So what might this look like? Well, he says the wise person is able to determine what the minimum is that her nature requires and easily and quickly satisfy those needs. And by working with a minimum like that, we never feel the pain from the absence or failure to satisfy a complicated need. So here's another way of saying that, right? I could desire steak, lobster, and $200 whiskey every night. Right? Or I could desire bread and water. If I personally can be satisfied with just bread and water, then I should habituate myself. I should realize that's the minimum that I require to be happy and go after that every day and be okay with that. For some of you, right, you're going to hate bread and water. So you that's not going to be an option for you. Maybe you need uh, mac and cheese and cereal. You need some variety in your diet, but you still realize that your minimum is far below these other complicated needs you could have. And so you should try and eliminate all of those really complicated and difficult to satisfy needs, like a need for steak and lobster every night, realize what your minimum is, and be happy there. Right, so that's why I have the picture of the monk, that sort of ascetic lifestyle, realizing what the minimum is that you need to be happy and running with that. And why is that the way you live the most sort of ideal life for Epicurus? Well, it's because if you have all these really complicated needs, right? If you need steak and lobster every night, that's going to require you to make a lot more money. It's going to require you to spend more of your time working to get that money when you could be doing other things you enjoy more, right? So you could um, be spending your time solving problems, creating art, forming meaningful friendships, right? If you just minimized all of your needs. Okay, so now we have the major components. In the next lecture, we'll see why we shouldn't fear death. Thank you.